there are not many biological topics that make people as passionate as talking about invasive species and weeds. But do you really know what invasive species are? And do they really deserve such a bad reputation? You might be surprised to learn that the presence of non-native species is not always a bad thing. But before we even start getting into this topic, we need to get clear on the meaning of the different terms that are used to characterize the status of a species in an environment, as they're often oversimplified or used incorrectly. Native species are the organisms that are naturally occurring in a certain geographical area or ecosystem. They are defined as the organisms that either evolved at the place where they occur, or they historically naturally dispersed there without human influence. The term indigenous is sometimes used in place of native. To give you a few examples, imagine a koala that's native to eastern Australia, a raccoon native to North America, or a common daisy native to Europe. On the other hand, non-native species are those that are occurring in an environment that they're not native to, and where they didn't naturally evolve or disperse to. They've been introduced to the new geographical area, thus the term introduced species is often used. Human influence, whether intentional or unintentional, is the cause of the introduction. Remember the raccoon that I mentioned as a well-known North American native? Probably not many of you know that you can find raccoons in Europe as well. They were transported there from North America to be bred on farms for their fur. Even though the animals were captive at first, there were a few incidents of raccoons escaping into the wild, which in combination with some intentional releases in Germany in order to enrich the fauna, led to raccoon populations becoming established in the wild. There are many ways species can get introduced into new geographical areas. They can be accidentally transported, for example in ballast water of oceanic boats, bringing plants to new places to grow them as ornamentals or medicinals, introducing animals for their benefits, bringing domesticated animals as pets, introducing insect as a biological control, and others. For non-native species, we can use synonyms such as exotic, alien, non-indigenous, but remember that non-native doesn't equal invasive. When a species enters new territory, it's going to face different conditions from those in its native territory. Different climate and weather patterns, a different type of soil, a new set of species that it will cohabit with, new food sources, and in many cases, new competitors and predators. The further status of the organism at this new place depends on how well it copes with all the factors in its new home and how its presence will affect the local, established ecosystem. One option is that the species won't be able to adjust to the new place, the population won't grow and it will die off. The second option is that the organism gets well incorporated into the new environment, it starts reproducing and growing its population, and will continue living there without any harmful effects on the local environment. In fact, it can even be beneficial. These introduced species are then often called naturalized. Now, another scenario is that the species establishes itself in the new environment, starts reproducing and spreading, and becomes a threat to the local environment. These invaders often end up outcompeting the local native species, and it might reduce their populations or even drive them to extinction. They can also cause significant economic losses such as in the case of invasive zebra mussels that clog water pipes, causing millions of dollars in damage every year. In these cases, we refer to them as invasive species. So all invasive species are non-native, but not all non-native species are invasive. The problem is that the difference is not always clear or even agreed upon, and as a result, all non-native species generally get a bad reputation. For example, the common dandelion is a non-native plant in North America, where it was brought from Europe for its medicinal properties. It is widespread and can be abundant, especially in disturbed areas like lawns. 
The common dandelion is a great source of pollen for insects, especially during the early spring, when there aren't many flowers out yet. It can grow in disturbed sites and conditions where other plants don't thrive, making it a valuable food source for grazing animals at some places. While some label common dandelion as merely a naturalized species, recognizing its benefits and admitting that they don't pose much of a threat to native species, others consider it to be an invasive weed that should be controlled. The importance of keeping dandelions around for bees is often used as an argument. Speaking of which, the European honeybee, an important pollinator in the United States, was brought there from Europe in the 1600s, and is thus not native. But many plant species, especially crops, are dependent on it for pollination, and the benefits of this introduced species are greatly appreciated. I hope you're starting to see how this issue is not as black and white as it's often presented. Another challenge is that it takes time to see whether a species will turn out to be invasive in its new range or not. This is nicely illustrated with many ornamental plants brought by horticulturalists to be cultivated in new parts of the world. The plants might seem to be safe at first, especially while growing in gardens, but one can never be sure how they're going to behave when they escape into the wild. This happened, for example, with Bermuda buttercup, which covers lawns in coastal California every spring. As pretty as its yellow flowers look, this initially ornamental plant became a weed that pushes away other plants. It reproduces by bulbils, underground reproductive structures, which make it very hard to get rid of. And the list of ornamentals that became a problem goes on and on. Water hyacinth, English ivy, periwinkles and Japanese honeysuckle are just a few examples of ornamentals that became invasive in many parts of the United States. These stories often make me wonder about those seed packets that are so popular these days and people love to plant them to attract pollinators. Most of the time, there's not even a list of species that the packet contains, and if there is one, you'll often find non-native species there. One of the popular species in these mixes is California poppy. This western United States native can be increasingly seen growing in garden beds in Europe, and while for now it doesn't seem to pose any threat to the local fauna, we don't know what's going to happen in a few years, when those poppies get fully adapted to their new environment. They might very likely spread outside of the gardens, maybe even hybridize with local native species, and possibly causing a havoc in the environment. Or maybe not. Positive effects of non-native species on the environment are also a possibility. This is something that is not often talked about. Non-native species often take on the role of native species that are, for whatever reason, no longer present in the environment. For example, many species of non-native birds in the Hawaiian Islands now play a crucial role in seed dispersal of native plants, as many of the native birds who used to spread the seeds are now either extinct or have disappeared from that environment. Nature has a unique ability to always find a balance, so sometimes the stories of exotic species get really complicated. In the 1800s, salt cedar, or tamarisk, was introduced into the United States for erosion control, as well as an ornamental. Growing abundantly along rivers in the southwest, this hardy tree started pushing out native plants, taking up valuable water thanks to its deep roots, even drying up streams and rivers. Since this plant is seemingly indestructible, the eradication efforts of this invasive are costly and mostly ineffective. To help in the war against tamarisk, a tamarisk-feeding beetle, native to Asia, was introduced to the United States as a biological pest control. These beetles are very good at destroying tamarisk foliage. However, in the meantime, the reduction in numbers of native trees, mainly willows and cottonwoods, in the habitats now dominated by tamarisk, led to the federally endangered southwestern willow flycatcher starting to nest in the invasive tamarisk trees. To preserve this endangered bird, the release of the tamarisk beetle is now banned in many places across the southwest, 
even though it's already well established there. To make the story even more complicated, scientists are now starting to believe that the tamarisk is not such an evil plant after all. Poor water management and increased water usage might actually be the main cause for the disappearance of native willows and cottonwoods. The non-native tamarisk is more hardy and can take up water from deeper down in the soil, so it has an advantage over the native vegetation and is thus becoming more abundant. There are so many stories that illustrate the complexity of native versus non-native species and their impact on the environment. Many native species rely on non-natives for their survival, while other non-natives cause significant damage in native populations. The status of every organism in its environment is ever-changing. Not everything is as black and white as it's often presented, and we should assess the harmfulness of any given species at any given time and place individually, rather than simply celebrating native species and automatically demonizing non-native ones without any context, or even worse, referring to all non-natives as invasives. And we didn't even get into natural dispersal. Species shifting their home territory without human intervention due to changing conditions, or even purposeful reintroductions. I could spend hours telling you different stories of both successes and failures of species invading new territories, but I would rather hear from you. Do you have any invasive plants or animals where you live that are causing problem to the local environment? And what about some exotic species that live in harmony with local flora and fauna? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, Please let me know by liking, sharing, commenting and subscribing to this channel. A special big thank you goes to all my patrons who are continuously supporting me on Patreon. If you'd like to join them, please check the link in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.